Yo, what up, what up, what up? Welcome back to Pinoy Dukes. So, my boy uh, Gio sent me the Praise of Folly channel, right? Where basically this guy has, at this point, this is his 32, 32nd uh, episode on breaking down mold bug and, you know, I mean, standing here going, we're going to escape the mold bug matrix. Um, and I'll be honest with you, okay? Like, I'm a fan of Yarvin. Um, because, you know, like my introduction to political theory is Machiavelli, right? And, you know, he's of the Italian school. And I wanted to stand here and because, like, I listened to a few of his episodes, and I'll be honest with you, like, yo, they're really long. They're like three hours a piece, you know what I mean? And so I'm going to stand, like, and they, they're still in the unqualified reservations era, right? The 2007, 2008 stuff that he was writing. And he disappeared as of 2010, didn't pop back up until 2017, 2018. But this episode, he brought on Charlemagne, right? Where Charlemagne has stood here and kind of gotten away from Mobug because of the fact that, you know, I mean, like, all these people, they want somebody to be an activist, right? They want somebody to stand here and give you a solution to problems, right? And Mobug says, listen, the solution to your problem is that, like, you need a king, <laughs> right? Where I may or may not disagree, right? The problem, like, if we had a Caesar type of king, we'd be fine, right? Because Caesar came from the popularity. Right. You, you need an individual to go like, yeah, you know, OK, well, if you want to be a country, right, where like, you know, this is you know, I mean, the United States, you want to be a country, you have to have somebody who's willing to, you know, I mean, understand that you go, yes, like, you know, the, the rural people are right. And then you go, you know what? Yes, the city people are right. Right. And yes, you know what I'm saying? The suburban people are right. Like all you people are right about everything. And then you start. Right. And then you stand here and you separate these individuals out. You know, and you rule them differently. You give them more autonomy. You, you, you have a pillared system, right? So these are things that I'm going to break down as I get into this, you know what I mean? But I wanted to stand here. There's going to be a point where we're going to have to skip through a little bit of this because Charlemagne's mic goes kind of like, you know, full robot, which mine does too all the time. Like, I understand, bro. Like, you know, my internet connection is trash. So we're going to get into this. We're going to have some conversations and we're going to, you know I mean, stand here and break some of this down because I think his original writings, right, were a critique of the liberal system, right? And his new writings are more prescriptive, right, in the gray mirror. And especially, like, the actual book itself, right, the chapters, you know what I mean? Like, not, like, the, the, the writing as a whole, you know what I mean? Like, because he has, like, a lot of blog posts, he has poetry he puts on there. It's a proper old school blog, you know what I mean? It's him and his thoughts, right? So, which I don't really like the poetry, you know what I mean? I'm not that type of guy, you know, I'm just not, you know what I mean? And his breakdowns of things are hit or miss, you know what I mean? Like when it comes to the geopolitics angles of stuff, you know what I mean? Like when he's breaking down, like what's going on in Ukraine, all these type of things. But you have to understand where he comes from, right? He comes from a State Department background. So therefore, you know, his solutions are going to be much different than ours. So let's get into this, you know what I mean? And then we'll have a conversation. Hello, this is Todd Lewis, the Praise of Folly podcast. I'm joined by my co-host, Logos, and a special guest, Charlemagne. And I think, Charlemagne, you had me on with Dave uh, about three or four months ago to discuss uh, the mold bug matrix. We were about halfway through 2007. And I thought it'd be a really cool idea to sort of discuss with you your whole journey out of the mold bug matrix. So where were you politically before you found mold bug? Well... Moldbug was kind of my uh, turn to the proper right, I would say. When I found Moldbug, I was pretty much in full uh, MAGA Trump mode. You know, Trump was president. I, you know, supported him pretty strongly in his campaign and as president. But obviously, you know, something was seriously wrong uh, by the year 2017 uh, in terms of his presidency. So I was kind of looking for answers to like why this wasn't working like it was supposed to like it was advertised basically so that's where i was when i found mold bug all right so what what about mold bug attracted you to his brand of the right 
Well, there was, uh, I read his entire open letter to open-minded progressives, which I don't think you've gotten to yet. Um, I think you got to the first part of it, actually. Um, that's kind of his seminal work in terms of his uh, unqualified reservations blog, I think. And honestly, it was like one paragraph in, I think, part eight of that letter that really put me over the edge of like being like, okay, this guy has this guy understands what's going on. And there's some paragraph in like part seven or eight that actually talks about, um, I can't remember the Republican politician, but there was some crazy Republican politician back in Moldbug's time. I think he was like a, uh, some sort of Christian Republican or whatever. And he talks about how, you know, this guy could run and he could act basically act like batshit crazy um, is how, you know, that campaign would go. And that's sort of, one way of running as a Republican. And he, he kind of more or less described how Trump campaigned. And so I found in a sense, he was like predicting not only Trump's campaign style, but also what would happen. And, you know, I just sort of found it really compelling. I found his whole diagnosis of how power in the United States works really compelling in particular, like how Moldbug describes the media, how he describes the United States as a press controlled state and I think if you were, you know, living through the 2015 to 2017 era, the, the concept of a press controlled state was, uh, you know, just hearing those words articulated like that really opened a lot of windows for me because that sort of phrase. And I think I even say this in my video way back in the day, that sort of phrase is just not in our lexicon. Right. You can talk about state controlled religion, um, a religion controlled state, a state controlled press. But the idea of a press controlled state is a very foreign idea. All right, so, okay, the unqualified reservations is where he gets into the idea of the cathedral, right? And the cathedral is probably his most prescient work, right, in the end of the day. And the basic premise of the cathedral, for anybody who doesn't know, right, it's an idea that comes out of very um, Italian political thinking, which is the mentality of, like, let me explain how power operates, right? Because... <laughs> That's what Italian, Italian political theory is. It's just very simply like, oh, let's find out where the power is, how it moves, how it operates, where it comes from, how the like how the people got power, these type of things, right? And like what the attachments are. So the the premise is this, okay? And then you have to you have to match this as well with things like Albion seeds and um, uh, God damn it, um. Burnham's managerial, uh, you know, I mean, political theories, um, you know, like Burnham's ma the managerial, uh, the managerial elite, right? You, what is it? The rise of the managerial class, something along these type of lines, right? All right. Anyway, right. So, basically, the premise is this. Okay, you have a system, right, in the United States that set up where, if you look at the country, okay, everybody above Pennsylvania, right, are what's known as the Puritans. Okay, and then you have PA, which was the Dutch and the Germans and the Quakers, right? And then, you know, I mean, south of that, you had the Cavalier class, the original 13 colonies, right? And then each of these groups stood here and settled a certain part of, you know, I mean, the rest of the country, right? Whether it be like the Scotch Irish out of the Appalachians going to Texas, right? And like having the Wild West, right? And settling places like California, you know, I mean, and then you have like the, the Northeastern individuals. And go across and go into the upper, you know, I mean, uh, where like Michigan, Detroit, Chicago is, right? And, you know, I mean, like the, the south, you know, I mean, settling the plains, right? So actually, uh, you know what? The plains were actually settled by uh, New England. But the thing is, with this, what you ended up having happen because of the geography and how it works, right? Because like what the geography is, what they had to do was, is in the north, you had to work three times as hard to be able to like survive. Right. So because it's rocky, it's mountainous, you know what I'm saying? It's colder temperatures. Like you have to, you know, I mean, stand here and like grind harder, become more industrial, become more inventive. Slavery doesn't really work because, you know, like uh, slaves don't work in cold temperatures. Right. That's why like Northern Europe didn't do a lot of fucking slaving. Right. Like in Northern Europe. Right. Like the Southern, like the, in Italy, you had lots of slaves. Why? Because like, oh, fucking, you don't have to house them. Like it's warm all year round, right? When you have to house them and keep them warm and feed them proper food and all these type of things and take care of like the medical conditions and the cold fucking slavery becomes like a, a, a loss. You know what I'm saying? You're better off having people care for themselves. So in all that, which you ended up having in that Puritan culture where, you know, they were, they came over and they had that mentality to begin with. And then they stood here and they had 
um, they stood here and they ended up growing into being like an industrial powerhouse and then became the brain of the country. They ended up creating parts of the country that became the brain long term, which was Harvard, Princeton, Yale, the university systems, right? These are all Northeast systems, right? Northeastern universities. And then you go down, right? And then what ends up happening is, is you have, they have to convince, right? Pennsylvania, Ohio, right? Texas, places like this to go along with what they want politically, right? And, you know, I mean, this, because like they're always arguing with the people who settled the South, which was the cavalier class that came out of Britain, right? So understanding all this, right? Which ends up happening is, right? Hang on, and listen, alarm went off. Right, which ends up happening is, is you stand here and you have a, a university system that stands here and trains all of the managerial elite in the country, right? Whether that be in bureau, the bureaucracy of the government, the bureaucracy of uh, corporations, the bureaucracy of the media, right? And the media is the arm that sits here and controls like the basic political theories and the Overton window and how individuals and what's acceptable thinking and acceptable political ideologies in the country. Right. And so therefore, what you end up having is, is you have the universities, right, training all the people who stand here and control the money to interest. Right. It's that uh, Marxian long march that a lot of people talk about, people like Jordan Peterson. Right. But, you know, I mean, like these have always kind of been, you know, I mean, very, very progressive things. And this is what he lays out in unqualified reservations. Um, and he talks about this later on, like the interviews that he does on Tucker and Michael Malice and, you know, I mean, other things of this nature, right? Which, I mean, I, I fucking stand here and I go like, yes, because my channel really what it is is political cartography, right? I'm standing here drawing a map of how everything really operates as opposed to how we're told. And he gets into this when he talks about like the descriptive, con the descriptive constitution of like, you know, I mean, the new state or the new country, right? And in his new gray mirror works where he stands here and he talks about con like constitutional drift. So with having that understanding, right, it's highly important to understand that like you know, the press controlled state is an idea that the basic premise is this in order to be able to, it's, it's Noam Chomsky's manufacturing consent, which is a hundred percent true. Right. Because like if you stand here and you do something completely off the wall, like you won't get reelected. Right. You won't have like the will of the people be willing to allow you to do the things that you're doing. Right. And this is an, in a democracy. Right. Which, you know, I know that, you know, they're standing here and we say, like, you know, they stole the last election, whatever the case is, you know, just bear with me. You know what I mean? Like, oh, they picked the candidates. You're not wrong. You know, I mean, like a super delicate, super delegates in the Democratic Party, 100 percent picked the picked the, you know, I mean, uh, the candidate, right? But in things like the Republican Party, you can run populists who, no matter what they do, they can't keep them out. <sighs> but the news media, right? Which you know what I'm saying, um, has been kind of destroyed right with the american people not with the managers but with the general population it is is a different thing so and then you get into the ideas of the deep state and all this type of stuff but these are highly important ideas to understand right you know what i mean and this is you know i mean kind of where we're at but yo look we're gonna we're gonna keep rocking i just want to break down that idea to y'all and I think ultimately that idea is actually incorrect. Um, I think it's pretty been well demonstrated that the the media does not run the state. The the finance interests primarily run the state. But nevertheless, at the time, it was a very compelling thing to see written. Yeah, I don't I don't think that's true, right? And I've been arguing about this. Now let me let me let me put this this way, okay? So. And this is where we get down into like the ideas of this cathedral thing, right? So like the basic premise is this, the financial interest running the state is, I think a misnomer. I think the financial interest served the state, right? I'm not, I'm not a thousand percent sure where it's the dog wagging a tail or the tail wagging a dog, right? Because I'm not, it's, it could be six of one and a half a dozen of the other at this point. 
But this mental of looking at it in this manner, of going like, you know, the financial interest run the state, you go, they're not doing a lot of things to make money, right? What they're doing is, is that they're standing, like, they're serving the state's interest, right? And the state is also serving, like, it's it's a parasitic, like, both ways relationship, right? It's like a binary relationship between the two. I'm not 100% sure, like, and this is where, this is where Yarvin comes into handy, where you go, like, man, the managers both came from the same place. Hmm. So, like, if the manager, the managerial class all came from the same thing, right? You know, this, this mentality, right, makes way more sense, right? Where you go, like, oh, they're the same people. They're serving their class. They're not serving, you know what I mean, like, the, the financial interest. It's, you know, this, is the, this is the managerial class serving the managerial class and expanding the managerial class and doing what's best for the managerial class. Right. Like the 2008 financial collapse. Right. And, you know, what I mean, like the bailout of the banks and all this type of shit. And then like in the covid bailing out, you know, what I mean, like the upper class. Right. And the billionaires and all this type of stuff. Right. That wasn't that wasn't serving the billionaires. That was bailing out the boomers. Highly important shit to think about in the end of the day. Right. Because like, you got to have like a well-rounded education and everything to understand all this shit. You know, what I mean, so all right, we're going to keep going, man. Let, let's let's keep rocking. Now, would, would it, so the last essay he wrote for Unqualified Reservations was in 2016. And then, and then he started Grey Mirror in 2020. And would it be fair to say that it was in that window where he wasn't really writing anything new that you sort of started to really gain traction with Moldbug? Absolutely. Uh, that, that window was actually when I started getting into Moldbug. And really, he more or less stopped writing in like 2010. I think he had a few minor posts since then but yeah he had stopped writing completely as far as my perspective was he was just this sort of archaic right-wing thinker who had just all but disappeared and we'd never hear from him again but he had some really interesting ideas so i just sort of took to popularizing those ideas along with a few other people and then yeah he suddenly just reappeared on the stage which was which was quite jarring and we can get into in your next line of questioning well, yeah, but as to your, your channel, in fact, your channel was in fact started in part uh, to express and expose people to Moldbug's ideas, correct? Yeah, I'll be honest with you, man. Like, I don't, I don't like this like courtroom setting type of thing. Like, sir, please state for the uh, state for the record. Uh, what is your what is your name and uh, date of birth? And sir, can can you please tell me where you were on the night of the fifth? Now, were you or were you not standing here trying to promote these ideas? Like, this really sounds like a heretic trial. Like, yo, man, listen, like, this is, <sighs> bruh, like, real shit. Like, just awful. You know, <laughs> yo, man, listen, like, yo, there's no, how do I put this, man? Like, no charisma whatsoever on this one here, man. Like, legit, like, just sound, yo, just sounds bad. Like, yo, legit, sounds bad, man. You know what I mean? Let's keep rocking up. More or less, I had had a YouTube channel, you know, for probably like eight years at that point, because I had just made one, you know, back when YouTube started becoming popular, not for political reasons, but just for uploading random videos and stuff. And then around the 2015, when politics started getting really crazy, I, you know, I felt an urge to, to do something to try and contribute or help. And eventually I found my niche with the mold bug videos. So I would consider my first mold bug video like the proper start of the channel where I sort of figured out what I'm doing. And that's really, you know, the the keystone of my entire channel is that series explaining Moldbug in the context of uh, Trump's campaign and presidency. All right. So when when did you start souring on Moldbug? I know a lot of people did when he wrote in Grey Mirror his Hobbits versus Dark Elves essay. Well, it was kind of a process. I mean, when he came back with his clear pill blogs i think for the american mind those hit weirdly he was sort of summarizing his ideas that he had written in unqualified reservations in an even more simplistic way than than you are put it but there was this sort of undertone of inaction being pushed in his uh clear pill blogs in particular and a lot of people found that 
jarring and off-putting. I really stumped for Moldbog still at that point, and I was kind of on board with his clear pill stuff, which is basically the idea of just sort of seeing through politics, sort of viewing politics as if you were like an expat living in a foreign country and not becoming like emotionally tied or really tied in any way to any particular ideology. I mean, at the end of the day, it's pretty standard, you know, Machiavellianism type stuff. But something was always nagging at me at the back of my mind about the whole clear pill idea and how once he started Gay Mirror, um, like almost all of his blogs seem to be oriented towards like inaction, like don't do anything because if the right does stuff that triggers the left and it provides them energy and then they just, then they just oppress you more. And the best thing you can do is kind of just, you know, not engage in politics, which is kind of confounding because it sort of leaves you in this position where you're basically being advised that any action you possibly could take is counterproductive. And yet you still want to try and take some sort of action. All right. So like, okay, so here's, this is this is this is kind of important, right? So here's here's the premise, right? When your enemy is fucking up, <laughs> you don't stop them. <laughs> well, you legit, you let them do what they're gonna do. You know what I mean? Because like when your enemy's standing here, like giving you a win, like yo, don't you know, don't sit here and like try to like you know not take it. Right, and that's the premise. Right, in the end of the day, like your enemy's making mistakes, you just let them keep making mistakes. Um, this idea of right wing activism, right, is nonsense because, like, there is no right wing activism. It's just anti left, right. And this is the problem: is that like, and this is this is kind of where a lot of these, you know, I mean, like right wing, uh, fucking technocrat. Like, you know what I mean? Like, fucking college-educated retards don't understand is that when you stand here and you trade away all your culture and your heritage, you don't really have a place to stand. Man, listen, bro, I don't, I'm not wearing pants. You can't climb up my skin. All right? Right? Sorry, I'm kidding. Right? You know, like, and I'll be real, I still haven't named it. I probably should at some point. I'm like, yo, just, I didn't name the ducks or the chickens. I don't know why. I don't name things. Having a hard time with that recently. Maybe it's just I don't want to get attached. I don't know. Whatever. Right? So, <clears throat> this idea of standing here, you're fighting on sand uphill. And you don't really have anything to stand on. Like, when you talk about, like, the American culture, right? It's hot dogs, F 150s, and, you know, I mean, like, AR 15s. It's not a culture. Like, you don't have some deep-rooted geographical-based nation-state, right? You, you don't have something to go like, you know, this is, you know, like, my granddaddy, granddaddy, granddaddy did this, you know, like, fucking, you don't have that. We gave that, the boomers gave that up completely. And so, getting that back and having a place to fight from is difficult, number one. Number two... When Mobug writes, and he writes about this, and you know what I mean, like why the right always loses, right? It's because, like, he talks about the guerrilla Americans, right? Where, like, you know, they don't really want to do anything. They don't want power, right? This is, this is the big part of this, right? It's like, yo, look, if you don't want power, like, what are you fighting for? The right don't want to rule. Like, if you're not willing to rule and you have somebody and you're fighting somebody who is willing to rule, you're going to lose. Right? Like, what? He said it on Tucker. He said, listen, man, right? He said, listen. Like, it's like having, it's like having a king who's a, like a six-year-old kid, right? The best he can do is, like, put somebody, like, in charge who's not going to molest him. Right? And that's where the right is right now, is that, you know, you have all these people who are grill Americans. They don't want to put any work in. Right? They don't want to stand here and actually, you know what I mean, like, maintain, you can't maintain political, you know what I'm saying, like, f fervor. You know what I mean? Like, it just, because, it, like, when you're sitting here and, like, you have these outbursts of political anger, right, they're very short-lived, especially with the right, because the right, you know what I mean, wants law and order. So they're not willing to protest. They're not willing to go burn things down. They're not willing to go do things, right? And once we do, 
then like we're talking like open states of revolution. And again, the right don't want power. So what do you do? And they're like, again, like this is where mobile goes to like, oh, your best bet is to elect the king and you're not willing to do that yet. You're not willing to get there. Right. And like, I'm not a hundred percent like with that ideology, like I'm about the national divorce idea, right? Where I think you know, like we should have probably like 10 or 15 different countries, you know, based on geographical basis, right? You know, I've broken this down a bunch of times before I have a map I have, right? <laughs> but all these things that we're talking about here are, you know, basic understandings of political theory, right? And so the object isn't to win, right? Like the object is to like get them to leave you alone and they're not going to leave you alone. What do you do? Like your best bet is to, you know what I mean, stand here and let them, you know what I mean, swing themselves out and realize that they're their own monster. You know what I mean? That's, that's where it is, right? And you know, this is where it gets down to with guys like Bill Maher because I'm going to tell you what, you're going to lose, we're going to lose this next election. 2024 and the reason is is because of the fact that like we stood here and tried to you know i mean like force our beliefs on everybody else right with abortion with the affirmative action things you know i mean with these all the all these supreme court decisions why because they feel like they're under attack that's where we are right now you know so that's that's the basic mentality Right. Having political action on the right wing side, like it doesn't really solve anything. Number one and number two it restricts massive amounts of like your ability to like do the things that you want to be able to do. And most people aren't really with having, you know, like evangelical beliefs, you know what I mean? Like pushed upon like the rest of the nation, like they don't want a theocracy. Some people do. And if you do, you don't want to be in this country. And that's fuck. That's fine by me. That's not fine by anybody else. Again, these aren't winning strategies in the end of the day. You're going to lose, right? Like, the moment, you, like, again, and like, just, it's like the whole, like, Eminem thing, right? Where, like, they stood there and they burned all of his albums. What they did, they made him the most popular rapper who's ever lived. Basic. You're not going to win, right, by standing here, like, doing these right-wing activism things because it looks bad and nobody likes it. And the liberals see it as, you know, I mean, sitting here being, you know, as, as you standing here trying to, like, institute the witch hunts again. You know what I mean? Or the Inquisition. Or your Nazis who are going to put people into, like, you know, in furnaces. Because this is what we've been trained to think, right, for the past 40 years. So that's where you are right now. So the idea of having political action is just unviable at the moment. When they go, oh, and you go, oh, man, listen, we took down Bud Light, we're taking down Disney and Star Wars and, you know, Indiana Jones and all these type of things. Like, oh, great. And what? You know what I mean? Like, and what? You got rid of, like, some Goy Slop. One Goy Slop beer company. You know what I mean? You got Target standing here pulling back on the LGBTQ stuff. <laughs> You, you, you act like you've solved anything in the end of the day. Anything you push down is going to pop back up. It just, it always works that way until you separate yourself out, until you're willing to stand here and elect somebody who you know, is going to actually rule as a dictator and fix all this shit and destroy the monster from within. And we're not willing to do that. Let's keep rocking back. And, and by action, I don't even mean like, you know, going to some sort of a, rally or something but even just like producing youtube videos or something like that so that really rubbed people the wrong way uh, including me and then eventually we got to his infamous dark elves essay and you know that's where i just sort of completely heel turned on mold bug and haven't been able to i haven't really been a fan of mold bug ever since then because i think that essay was a big mistake on his part where he sort of revealed his real class interests you know, you guys have sort of sussed out what Moldbug really is in a very um, complete and engrossing way in your series. But Yarvin sort of made the mistake of revealing it in a very simple way in that blog. And so it's, it's not just that one blog that, you know, turned me off of him, the Dark Elves blog. 
I think people can get that impression sometimes uh, of myself or others who have sort of turned against Mold Bug, but it was really more of a, a process, you know, that started with his Clear Pill essays. And by the time he started writing about his Dark Elves, that was that I had just gotten completely fed up with him. Now, this is something I don't want to get too far ahead, but this is something that Logos and I have pointed out after his interview with Oren McIntyre. Literally everything in the interview that people didn't like was in 2007 you are. But what I want to say here is, as from hearing your the progression, that it would seem, and tell me if you think this is a fair characterization or not, the time was just so different back in 2007 to 10, you know, the Bush years, the early Obama years, that as society has moved beyond that, even though Moldbug hasn't really changed what he believes, it just has aged very poorly relative to the meta of this country. And that when he first came on the scene at the beginning of the computer revolution, it seemed like, you know, the next hot thing, but but that's because there was a sort of contingent factor to it. Well, yeah. Can you say it again? Uh, did we lose Charlie? Oh, much better. Could you just start the whole line of questioning over again? Or response, I mean. Yeah, well, I mean, when, when Yarvin first started writing back in 07, I mean, the stuff he was writing was fairly visionary, I would say, just in terms of the, the level of analysis he was providing for just why right-wing politics were not working. Whether you're talking about Buchanan or libertarianism or any of this stuff, none of these movements worked at all. And it was all kind of the same reason that they didn't work, which was that... Uh, you know, you had you had this media apparatus that could basically control all of the information flow about what these things were, but Trump sort of changed the game a bit. Uh, you know, whatever you may think of him, he he introduced this sort of postmodern politics to America and really upset the he he changed the the horizon of what one could do in politics in order to get one's message out or or advance some particular interest. So I think Moldbug's writings are very much still constrained by a sort of a authentic modernist type of politics. Whereas when you start getting into a postmodern style of politics like Trump does, where he sort of breaks down all the barriers of respectability and even just, you know, literally lies and makes things up even, um, this sort of changes the game to what's available. And just also the, the type of organizing we've done on the internet since, you know, 07, 08, 09, since Moldbuck was writing has, has opened up a lot of opportunities to us as well. So I think uh, the th Moldbug's recommendations, people sort of treat them as gospel and I don't see any reason, reason to treat them that way. They were definitely applicable just a, uh, a few years ago, but I don't really see any reason to listen to the guy at this point when he's basically telling us to not do anything, even though it's pretty clear we have significant material successes going forward at this point. I mean, and you can just look at the Supreme Court. I mean, I think the decisions that have come out of the Supreme Court kind of totally BTFO mold bug, especially the affirmative action win, because that does strictly meet his definition of what a victory is. A victory is something that makes future victories more likely, which the affirmative action overturn obviously does, because it makes it that much more easy to get our type of people in the get in the door, because this is one less barrier in the way. So, right. So, in your sort of uh, you know coming to terms with the fact that Moldbug maybe wasn't what he th what you thought he was. <laughs> okay, let me let me say this right, and I mean this is this is highly important. Okay, and I've already mentioned this before. Right. The problem is, is that you are not going to maintain power, right, as a whole, if you continue to try to rule this way, right? You're standing here using the Supreme Court to go against affirmative action, right? And, you know, I mean, like, oh, they're just going to stack the Supreme Court. It's what they did before. What you're doing is, is you're making a total victory for them much more likely, right? And I, I've said this, you know, I mean, like before, and I'll say it again, right? The reasons why, like, things like abortion are legal, right? 
And I mean, the reasons why you need things like abortion is because of the fact that without women being free to be able to make whatever decision they want, you're not going to be able to have the modern economy that you have, right? Because women spend, like a single woman, you know what I mean, with no kids spends more, you know what I mean, than, you know I mean, an entire family of four on high-end garbage, you know what I mean, like high value added uh, products, you know what I mean, on plastic credit cards. It's this basic. Right. And then GDP number go up is the measure that the government runs itself by. And GDP number go up is the measure, you know, what I mean, like stock number go up is, the, you know, I mean, like way that all companies judge how they're doing. This is a basic premise. You know, I mean, and therefore they are going to stand here and just stack the Supreme Court and overturn these decisions. So, like, don't think that these are long term things that, you know, I mean, are actually victorious because it's guaranteeing that these people are going to fucking vote next time. This is just what it is. And I mean, you're going, this, all this shit is going to turn more and more, like, it's going to turn more left wing. You know, so like, under, like, you're creating a monster. This is what Molebug's saying, is you're literally creating a monster. And I know you guys don't understand this. Like, I get that premise. Like, y'all don't understand, like, the basics of this. And that's fine. You know what I mean? Like, I get it. Right? But like, this is... This is political theory 101 and shit. And I mean, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And I promise you, there will be one. You know, let's keep rocking. As you were increasingly disillusioned, how did you find uh, the series that Logos and I are doing on Moldblood? And, and how did that influence you? That's a good question. I don't remember how I found it. I, I mean, I think I was already following you because somehow I had become aware of your debates with the libertarians and, you know, <laughs> I just thought they were the best things ever because you just totally tore them apart in a way that I've never seen anyone do before. Um, I think it might have been actually Stephen Carson who had recommended me uh, one of those debates because I recall engaging with that uh, Stephen Kinsella guy on Twitter. Um, and I was like, wow, I don't I really don't like this person. Um, he's like a total asshole. <laughs> what can I find out about him? <laughs> <laughs> and then I think I may have come across your, your content through that route. And of course I had watched the Tom Woods show to some extent, especially during my more libertarian phase. Uh, not that I ever was a libertarian, but I was sort of leaning in that direction. Um, so I might've seen you on there as well. So I was kind of already engaging with your content to a light degree before you released that. And then of course, once I saw that you, that you know your video about Moldbug popped up my feed. I was like, oh, let me check this out because basically nobody is criticizing uh, Moldbug at this point. Not even a, just in a, and I mean criticizing in a very literal sense, not even in a hostile way. Like the microscope has not been applied to this guy, and it needs to be applied to this guy because you two coined this phrase in your series called the the Moldbug haunted right, and we're very much haunted by Moldbug's ideas. I see a lot of his ideas, you know, sort of peddled about as these one-liners and people don't even realize that this came from Yarvin and we should at least know where I'd, our ideas are coming from. Now I always knew Moldbug wasn't a right winger. He was, he, he was, if anything, Moldbug's always been consistent and open and clear about what he is, which is a progressive, uh, you know, he's never hidden that. That being said, I mean, I always thought, you know, you could, his advice or his sort of analysis was useful. Just like you could, take some of uh you could take lenin for example and you can realize that you know lenin's a communist but there still might be some interesting things that lenin lenin has to say about especially about organizing uh so you can learn from him uh but i think a lot of people mistakenly view yarvin still as some sort of right winger which he definitely isn't yeah so real quickly uh logos do you have any questions for charlie or anything you want to add Oh, hi. Uh, I've just been writing some notes in the background while you've been talking. Um, I got a few. I didn't know when would be the best time to bring them up was, but if, if we're segueing. Um, so the first question I had was, when you think about Moldbug's later articles and you think about his earlier articles, one connection that struck me for this whole thing is it seems that Moldbug exists purely to stop like a Weimar Germany backlash from forming on the right more so than he exists to, I don't know, cement any particular kind of politics or put forth any type of vision himself. What do you think about that? I think that's a fair analysis. I mean, basically all of his 
blogging since 2020 when he came back has been oriented towards getting right wingers to just sort of do nothing, not to get them to do anything particular, but just do nothing. And he, he never addresses the left. Um, and he sort of, okay. <laughs> All right. So look, man, and again, like, this is where, like, you actually have to go and read the gray mirror, right? You know, like, and understand things. Like, we broke all this shit down before. Like, he has, like, prescriptive ideologies of things. You know what I mean? And forming these ideas, right? Putting things out into the ether, right? The, the problem is, is that, like, the right wing really doesn't have a lot of solutions to problems, right? They, they really don't. Like, their solutions are more like, you know you know, Milton Friedman ideas, right? And, like, they're fucking garbage, and I hate Milton Friedman so goddamn much, right? Um, I understand what Mobug is, right? Same way I understand what Zihan is, right? Like, I bring, I bring you guys information about people who, you know, might be on a different political spectrum than the rest of us are, right? And might be somebody who, like, we are violently opposed to, like, what their prescriptions would be. But having an understanding of what they're saying is very, very important, right? Me and Mobug are two far, 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 far different individuals in where we come from, right? Like, I come from the absolute bottom of the bottom of the bottom, right? He was uh, international, you know what I mean? Like, elite Jew, his parents worked as state delegates, right? You know what I mean? He grew up all over the world, you know what I mean? He is a driftless cosmopolitan elite. Right. And like, this is something that I'm pretty sure like most people 100% know about him. Right. But having a guy come to you, right, who stands here and says like, hey, look, all this shit is terrible. You know what I mean? And him being an Anglophile, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Right. Him standing here being um, like the Anglophile that he is and sitting here going like, hey, look, you know, these are things that will work. These are things that won't work, right? Standing here wanting somebody to leave you alone is not a politically viable solution. That's the mentality of Mencius Mobug, right? That's the mentality of Curtis Yard, right? At the end of the day, it's that you're not, if you're not willing to take power, you're not willing to stand here and win. Right. That's it's that simple. If you're not willing, like if you don't want power, you're not going to win in a power struggle. Basic. Right. Like you people are standing here trying to police the left. You're not trying to beat them. That's not a solution because the left wants to rule over you <laughs> legitimately. Right. Like you're, you're standing here trying to control your shepherds. Like they're the shepherds. Like you know, that's this is this is the problem that you're not understanding, right? Like these motherfuckers are a hundred percent in control, and they're going to remain in control, right? Because they control the university, they control the media, they control the fucking government, they control like the deep state, they control the international business sectors, right? They control your corporate powers. They're they're going to win, right? Unless you're willing to stand here and actually take power, and go like, hey, look. I, you know, I mean, like, I want this. It's that simple, right? Like, these, these bullshit victories, right? There's a word I'm looking for, but I know, like, you know, I mean, like, I, I don't have it in my brain at the moment, right? The, these, the, these nonsense victories that you're having, right? The, these, these false victories that you're having, right, are going to be short lived and they're going to destroy you at the end of the day, right? Because literally, you're not taking power, right? There's this idea in warfare, right? Right, where like they're like, yeah, man, we can use drones and robots to do things. But what they're finding is, is that if you don't have men to hold that ground, you're just going to lose it anyway. You're not like it's it's, it's literally like going like, hey, look, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to go outside and I'm going to like, you know, I'm I'm going to knock down this hornet's nest and I'm not going to spray anything, right? Like I'm going to patch up this gunshot wound, but I'm not going to take the bullet out. You're not solving the fucking problem. You're putting a band-aid on a fucking on a knife wound. That's not the answer. You're taking you're taking Robitussin for your in lung cancer. 
It's not an answer. You're treating a symptom of a disease. You're not treating the disease itself in the end of the day. And this is why, like, these are all, like, you know, like pyrite victories. There is a word I'm looking for. <laughs> right? That's, that's, all, that's all these are. They're all fake. Right? They're all garbage and they're short-lived and they're going to fuck you up in the long term. The long-term solution is to understand the actual political, like, uh, fucking power struggle that you're in and understand like the cartography like understand the map of where we are politically that's highly important to understand and if you don't understand that if you don't understand like yo that if what you want right is not something that you can have this is not going to work for you like you don't understand your history you don't you're not studying like the, the basics you're so caught up in this philosophical ideology of like, hey, look, you know, we want to be successful as a country. You do understand you're just going to create more of them. They're going to fuck you up even worse. And you're going to end up in a worse position. This is not a solution in the end of the day. None of this is a fucking solution. Affirmative action, you know, bringing abortion, not solutions. It's going to cause more crime, more problems, more bullshit, more poverty, right? More, more nonsense. Things are going to explode even more. You're going to get more politically uh, turmoil, like turbulent. All you're worried about is, oh man, listen, you're like, I want to be able to get, you know, a fucking job over top of a black guy. It's not the fucking answer. <laughs> Just not. Oh man, look, now they're not killing babies. They're still going to kill babies. And when they don't, they're just going to charge you for the fucking child support. And then your community is going to become completely dysfunctional. Because you're going to have massively impoverished men who can't get fucking jobs and they're out of prison all the time. You don't understand what the fuck you're doing. You don't fucking get it. AI is coming. They're going to eliminate all these fucking jobs. You're going to have guys with child support. No fucking jobs. What are they become? Drug dealers. I went through this already. You fucking people are going to lose. You don't understand how we ended up here. You're not solving the fucking problem. You're fucking continuing down this path of going like, yo, America, right? What are you doing? This is not the answer. Let's keep going, bro. Lays Man. out a model in which one could be on the right and do some sort of activism, but I can't even really describe it because he's so unclear about what that really means. I think he uses terms like a, a dissident operative or something like that. Uh, so yeah, I mean, Moldbug's whole thing is to get right-wingers to not do anything. I agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so another thing that struck me when you guys were talking, um, so in 2007, in one of his earlier articles, he said that he doesn't want the right coalition to win when he's talking about the caste system. I believe what he said exactly was something like um, the right wing, uh, the OVA group on the right. Um, they're not very intellectual. They're terrible at politics. And he said, it's a very good thing. They're terrible at politics because he'd probably not want to live in the country if they won. Um, I mean, given that, how do people take mold bug as some kind of like a, right-wing figure when he's been so blatantly on the record about how much he disdains like the very base that makes up right-wing politics yeah well most people just haven't read Moldbug. i mean i think a lot of people have only watched my videos or only read his sort of major pieces like the open letter to open-minded progressives and they haven't gone into the deep cuts and if you do go into the deep cuts he does state very clearly things like this where you know, yeah, I don't want these guys to win because we're not on the same team. And he even uh, this this thing you just mentioned with the OVA and whatever the other acronyms were. He talks about this in his Coriolanus and the Conservatives essay, where he sort of frames himself as a Coriolanus. And in that essay as well, he makes it very clear that uh, he is not he doesn't want the Vulsions to win. He just hates the elite ruling class of Rome, which he's ostensibly a part of and wants to ally with these people and overturn it but he in no way has the same worldview or interest in them his only his only mutual interest with the right is really just in to the extent to where they can help him do his little 
reset scenario and get this sort of corporate government in place. But yeah, I mean, again, he, he's always clear on this. You don't have to read between the lines. He says it outrightly that uh, he's not a right winger. He doesn't want the right to win. He doesn't even like the right. Um, they are just the natural opposing force to the current form of the left, which he doesn't. Okay, well, all right. <laughs> all right, so the problem with the right wing, right, as a whole, like I have, I have the same fucking problems with the right wing. They're fucking retarded, right? They're 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 dumb. They're they're. I, they call what did you know, Vince Vaughn and the Jimmy Dory said the dick and pussy wing of the Republican Party, right? I fucking hate these guys. I go because number one, what it is is it's you know what I mean it's rich you know what I mean um, like upper middle class white folks who are you know what I mean either super Protestant right or two, it's white women standing here going like well how dare you right pearl clutching I just I hate all of them I hate them so much like they are the worst people. And I would never want to, like, be ruled over by them. And I have been my whole life. They fucking suck so much. Right? So, this understanding that mentality of them, right? Especially 2007, 2008. Oh, my God. Like, they were so bad. Right? Um, It's the... And in 2007, 2008, it was also like the pro go bomb brown people individuals. Like, just, it was just awful. They were garbage. Like, they were so trash. Right. Like, they were, they were so bad. And you have to understand when you think of like these right wing people, you think of like Ben Shapiro and Charlie Kirk today, right? And back in the day, it was Pat Robertson and Newt Gingrich and, you know, Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity. And even I remember because I was a Michael Savage guy back in like 2003, 2004, 2002, right? Um, like I used to listen to him. And I love Savage because Savage, you know what I'm saying, was like a New York guy. You know what I mean? Like um, he was a Russian Jew type of person, right? And... His dad was a glassmaker, right, in New York. And the reason why I know all these things, and I know nothing about who Sean Hannity's dad was or who Rush Limbaugh's dad was, is because Michael Savage would literally have whole shows where he'd call them, like, Friday Night Glass, and he'd just tell stories about traveling around the world and eating foods and coming up with, and I mean, um, he was a trained botanist, right? He had a PhD in botany, right? Like, he wasn't, like, your prototypical right-winger. Like, he was pro-rah-rah America, you know what I mean? Like, you know, like, you're, the immigrants type of guy, right? Which I loved, right? <laughs> like, hell yes, love that shit. He was anti-LGBTQ, right? But on the same point, he was well-traveled, well-spoken, well-written. Um, He was, you know I mean? Like, he loved food and, you know what I mean? His little dog that he had named Teddy, Right. And like he was like, oh, he loved cars. And, you know, like he, he stood here and had these stories about like guys from the street, you know, and guys from the block who, you know, just all the stuff. And it was amazing. Right. This, and he was a dissonant right winger. Right. Like he was a guy who right wingers were like, I fucking hate that guy. You know what I mean? Like the fucking, even the right wing media was like, nah, we're not going to have him on. Right. The left, like, he was the Tucker Carlson of his day, as it were, right? But, like, better, because, you know, he was way more interesting to listen to. I'll be, I'll be perfectly real, because he was, you know, like a normal human being. He came from, like, the lower class. Your average right-winger, though, is, you know, guys like Hush Bimbo or, you know, I mean, the Wall Knocker, right, Sean Hannity, um, these, these Ben Shapiro, Charlie Kirk types, right. Who have always been privileged upper middle class white kids who you don't want in charge. Like that is not the guy I want in power. It's just not right. I don't want a guy who, you know I mean? Cannot stand here and swing a hammer. I don't, I don't want a guy who's never put a roof on. I don't want a guy who's never changed the oil in his car. I don't want that person running things. Right. I also don't want the left running things. But ultimately, like if I had to choose between the two, I 
hate them both so much. I do. I hate them both. Like, I really do. Right? If I had to choose between, you know, the old left, like a Bill Clinton type, fuck Hillary, like a Bill Clinton type, and a Charlie Kirk, I'd choose Bill Clinton. If I had to choose between Obama and fucking you know, Ben Shapiro, I'd choose Obama. Right? In the end of the day, It just that's just the mentality, you know what I mean, of being a human being. Like just who do I like more as a person? <laughs> right? like, you know, that's kind of the mental that it gets down to, right? You know, like who do I want? Do I want the brilliant guy? Like Bill Clinton probably like the smartest person since Jefferson to hold office, right? You know, I mean, like Obama had an amazing grasp of things. He just didn't, you know, like meet with anybody. He was basically a puppet, right? At the end of the day he was an empty suit. You know, um, Trump, I'd choose Trump over all of them, right? But Trump's not a right winger. He's a city guy. Right? He's a New York guy. I'd prefer a New York guy, a Baltimore guy, a Philly guy. You know what I mean? I'd prefer somebody that came to Chicago, came from a place that's, you know, hard to make it, and you made it coming out of there. So you're going to have, like, this basic built-up um, ability right, to be a human, I don't want somebody from the suburbs, I don't want a right winger, you know what I mean, who grew up on a fucking golf course, it's that simple, you know what I mean, because they're not, like, George, like, W was fucking trash, I hated him, we all hated him, everybody did, anyway, yo, listen, man, we're gonna, let's, let's keep going, bro, doesn't like, that's a really good essay to cite, yeah, I, I remember me and Todd reading that essay and just being stricken by like how how crazy that uh, that whole picture he painted was. Um, so, the last question I had written down here was: you mentioned that you thought that Moldbug was a uh, a progressive. Now, I think me and Todd, when we read Moldbug, we get the idea that he's just more of like a a stern right libertarian in the sense that he thinks like corporate dystopia is like some kind of inevitability, so he wants it to happen sooner rather than later. And he just wants people to know who's really in charge, uh, which doesn't strike me as like a, a, a really progressive thing to think. Like, like Moldbug doesn't strike me as an egalitarian or somebody who's you know big on racial quotas and things like that. Uh, he thinks whatever the rules the corporation set are good. W what do you think the relationship is between libertarianism and progressivism? Do you mean it more like a, a socially liberal sense, or, or how, how do you how do you make the connection? Socially liberal. I mean, I really mean as pedigree because he's he's very. He uses the word progressive, I think, to describe his parents. He uses the word communist to describe his grandparents. So basically his pedigree is of the, the hard left in some capacity, be it literal communist or socially liberal people that you might call progressives. He's certainly this sort of a, he's certainly a corporate. Okay, so, man, listen, yo, this is the problem, right? The problem is, is none of these guys, all right, are city guys. Right. So like they didn't have the chance to interact with the amount of individuals that you need to interact with to understand fucking a guy like you are. Right. Toleration, to being tolerant, right, of individuals and their shit. Right. When you're in a major metropolitan area, right, you know, like a, I was, you know, Philly, New York, D more, whatever it is. Right. And you run into a a lot of different types of people. You, everybody from Dominicans and Puerto Ricans to like upper class Jews, right? You, you'll run the gambit. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like I literally, like, I'll be real. Like, I, I I've sold drugs to scientists, right? <laughs> Nuclear physicists and shit, right? You run into a lot of different people. And when you interact with all these people, okay? It, it run like there's not a lot of difference between a like I like I had to deal with like my stepmother was an upper class um, like Protestant right <laughs> Methodist right she's an upper class Methodist right she had the same basic views as the upper class communistic um, guys from Philly right who were like highly educated went to school you know what I mean like fucking their parents were rich. They had the same mentalities, right? They had they had the same exact mentals. So with that idea, 
right, of understanding that, you know, the, the communist and the upper class Christians have the same basic moral premises, right? And they'll do the same shit. Like, they'll all do the same drugs and drink the same way, right? This is, this is something that, like, a lot of people don't understand, right? Because, like, they don't interact with these people, right? And especially in a city, like, when you go to a brownstone, right, up in New York, right, and you're hanging out, um, you know, um, I forget the name of the place right now at the top of my head, but you go and you hang out, right? And, like, what you'll find is you'll find a whole bunch of kids, right? There's trans people running around, and there's a whole bunch of homosexuals, you know, like, a boy. there's mostly... You know, I mean, white, light-skinned people and Asians, right? But they're all super progressive, right? But, like, they'll all be communists. And Moldbug mentions, he said, but, like, you go back, like, fucking 100 years, there's the same fucking people there. The upper class is always the same way, right? And the reason why the upper class is always the same way is because, like, you know, they've always been the aristocrats. The aristocrats want to rule. Right. And like in ruling, they'll stand here and go like, oh, man, these poor people, like we should take care of them. Right. You know, we should have like ways to be able to like just take care of these poor people. We, they feel like we're animals. Right. It's the same way. Like I feel like you know, when you're looking like an animal that's hurt, like, oh, man, I'm going to I want to help you. Right. That's how they feel about us. It's the same shit. Identical same shit. Right. And that's, that's kind of where it gets down to. And that's why, like, you know, he goes, like, Mo Bugs are progressive. Like, no, Mo Bugs is rich, right? He came from a rich family. He was a fucking, he went to Brown as, um, uh, God damn it, a legacy. He was a legacy in admin at Brown, right? Brown's in an Ivy League university. It's hard to get the fuck into. Like, he was automatically admitted because his parents went there. You know what I mean? His grandparents were upper class Jews. Right? His parents were upper class Jews. He is an upper class Jew. It's what he is. Right? And understand something. They're all the same fucking way. You interact with them long enough, like, you're like, oh, I know what you are. Simple. Right? You know, you got it. You got to have, like, you got to. This is why white people, they don't understand shit, right? Because they don't have a culture. They don't have shit of their own. Right? So they, like, they see everything as being foreign, right? Because, like, they don't have anything to stand on on their own. It's just, this is why you'll get upset about things. And, like, I, I don't understand. It doesn't make any sense to me because I'm like, well, like, this is just what it is. Like, why are you getting mad that, like, you know, the ants being an ant? Like, you know, it's supposed to want your watermelon at the picnic. Like, that's what ants do. <laughs> why are you getting upset about this? Let's keep going, though libertarian and the, the the sternerism that you've identified um in him is actually uh pretty unique and i haven't seen anyone identify that before which i couldn't because i haven't read sterner but yeah he's not a progressive in like the very literal sense it's just a it's his pedigree that makes sense cool um that was all i had written down for now so you can keep asking questions todd yeah yeah so um uh, Lo Logos and I did the three videos at the end of the series before the event that I met you at in Tennessee, Charlemagne. Did you get a chance to see those three videos where we sort of sum up our case against Moldbug? Um, I think I did, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> You'd have to re-articulate it because so much has happened since then. No, that's fine. Yeah, because I, I kind of want to get your take of the meta where we're at now. So where we're at now for Moldbug is that Moldbug is trying to, quote, seduce somebody, but it's not the Brahmins on the left. He's already stated he's one of them. Uh, it's that he's trying to seduce those on the right to do nothing. So, for example, after The Hobbits versus Elves, uh, I also read some, some, when we cover that article in our series, we also look at some responses and raging Mandrill did a response and he put up a very good response if we do nothing and just let immigration continue then our side is doomed to lose and obviously moldbug knows this so and when 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 raging Mandrill said our side he means the right so clearly th that's sus uh there's the connection to the deep state that he hints at in 2007 he says oh yeah you know and when the news and the CFR agree on something, you have to listen because that's where the real people are. And then like literally a month later, he's like, oh yeah, I have like this relative in the CFR. 
like, listen to me, I'm connected to the, you know, I'm close to the centers of decision making. It's really odd that this follows right after he said, oh, yeah, the CFR is the canary in the coal mine. And I used to say, right, when all the media, right, agrees on something, that's when, like, your senses should go up, right? Listen, like yo, see this this conspiratorial ideology, bro, like yo, real shit. Like standing here thinking that like everybody is like always a CIA plant in the end of the day is nonsense, right? Because they're not like these people aren't like CIA plants or like they're not, you know, I mean sent to stand here and you know, like get you to like, you know, what are you doing? Huh? Are you hungry? Okay. Right, sorry about so I'm talking my cat. Right. Like yo. They like and when when how do I put this? Everybody's sitting here thinking that like there's some international conspiracy to do some shit is nonsense, right? At the end of the day, right? But like what it is is that you'll have right things that serve all the powers that be, right? And you have to be or you have to have an understanding what the power is and what the power wants like and this is why it's important to understand like that whole gdp number go up mean right so it's like the best thing ever why do you want to understand that it's because of the fact that that's how they judge themselves so if that's how they judge themselves is whether or not the gdp number goes up maybe you should pay attention right you know like when they stand here and they have something that's going to make gdp number go up when they all agree on something Right. That means that like, yeah, you know, like GDP number go up. Like, for instance, the agenda 2030, what well, the agenda 2030 is, is literally about giving females more rights and safety. Why? Because GDP number go up. Right. It's not an international conspiracy. Right. To stand here, you know, what I mean, and like, you know, protect women. It's an international ideology of going like, we know this makes GDP number go up. So GDP number go up. Right. More people, more, more, you know, I mean, like sales, all these type of things. It's what this is. Right. And having that understanding, right, having that basic premise of an understanding of, like, just the simple things will lead you very, very far in understanding things, right? And Molebug, like, as a whole, like, Yarvin, Curtis Yarvin, like, understanding, like, you know, like, yeah, again, he literally said his parents were, like, fucking State Department workers, so he's going to have family in the government. Of course, he comes from an upper-class Jewish family. They're going to have people in the fucking international industries, right? He's an international Jew. It's what he is. But does that mean you should like stand here and go like, man, listen, like he's telling everybody to do nothing. Yeah. Why? Best way to stand here and let the system collapse is to step back and let it fucking collapse. Fighting to save a system that's trying to fuck you is not an answer. This system isn't here to help you. This, this is not your country. Like, yo, this nation is not what it was. Let it collapse. This is what... God, bro, like, yo, look. Real shit. Until you're willing to rule. Unless you want to rule over these people and control all this shit and stop the trainings and stop the immigration and all this stuff. Right? You want to stand here and actually have power. None of this is an answer or a solution. Right? Standing here stopping affirmative action. Not a solution, bro. It's not. Like, yo, real shit. Are you stopping immigration? No. Is the court stopping immigration? No. Is the court stopping anything? No. You're just standing here pissing off the left. And I like that. I like pissing off the left. But I know it's dangerous. And that's the fucking problem. Like, yo, it's because, like, yo, when it's dangerous, they vote. Stop being fucking dumb. Like, yo, legitimately, let's rock. And then there was an interesting essay uh, by Ryan, Ryan, Brian Drarty in uh, Reason Magazine about Peter Thiel, where he says that Peter Thiel is closely connected to Milo Yiannopoulos and Moldbuck. He claims that he got this from emails that were acquired by BuzzFeed. Again, I haven't seen the emails, but assuming that he's a reputable reporter, and I think a lot of people on the right who have libertarian leanings would probably accept Brian Drowardy is a reasonable reporter. That's interesting. Well, what 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 might that connection be? And you know, how does that suss out? 
Okay, so there's that. And then there's also... Well, like, oh, I mean, this has already been broken down. It's not difficult to understand. Um, okay, so um, the dissident right. Uh, Peter Thiel got, um, he has candidates that he ran for, like, his political views, right? There's one guy, uh, J.D. Vance in Ohio, right? Um, the brain trust that Peter Thiel uses Right, you know, what I mean, for like a dissident right ideologies is like Yarvin Milo. Um, I'm trying to think here. Um, God damn it, shit. Who's the uh, accelerationist? I forget his name. Right. Um, doesn't matter. Either way, right. There's a bunch of guys, right, that like you know are part of like um, the right wing brain trust. Why? Why are you playing with the bag on the floor while I'm trying to record? Man, listen, cat. Right. Um. But yeah, so literally, like, these guys are the guys who, like, when you're standing here looking at, like, how you move in politics, right, you know, these are the guys who you go to because, like, oh, they're well-connected, you know, I mean, they're on the internet, they're, they're, you know, I mean, they understand, like, you know, the grassroots type of things, you know, I mean, like, all this stuff that's going on, you have to have these type of guys. So, like, when you want to sit here and start a new way of thinking, right, and have a new political ideology, you can't rely on like the old powers to be to help you out. You have to have like new guys with new visions, right? That, you know, I mean, believe in what you're doing. Yarvin's a great guy for this. Um, Zeon will be another great guy for this, right? Like if you want to stand here and like, again, like what you need is political cartography. You need a guy who's going to draw you a map of the power, right? This is, again, who's better than the Italian school guys? Nobody, right? <laughs> Let's keep rocking, though, bro. Like, it was just, man, listen, 23 minutes in, we're an hour and 11 into my video. Awesome. Also, he's shielding corporations all throughout 2007. He's, he's complaining about the socially progressive aspects of America. But all of these socially progressive aspects are the resort of corporate funding. You know, you, know, you can read E. Michael Jones's Libido Dominandi, the Rockefellers are behind. Kinsey and the Kinsey Institute and all, all of that, right? You've got all these other initiatives uh, which either have deep state backing. So for example, Gloria Steinem was at one point a CAA asset. Uh, you have a lot of rock and roll stars who had dads in the military. So for example, Jim Morrison, the doors, his father was in the Navy, but not just in the Navy. He was involved in the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Like this is, this is some weird, you know, deep state corporate stuff. And Mulebug is blaming absolutely the wrong people for this. You know, the academics in the university, which many of them got fired in 2020 for not telling. Okay, let's let's talk about this, right? You know what I mean? Because this, this is highly important. The think tank. All right. God damn it, bro. Listen. All right. So this isn't just Yarvin, right? This is a lot of people. Here's, a, here's how this worked, all right? Wilson. <clears throat> was one of the first like actual academics brought in right i mean we're going from the gilded age to the modern you know, i mean like neoliberal age, or modern liberal age that we have today right so you had wilson right who came out of maryland university right and wilson stood here and brought in a lot of academics in the government to stand here and like have um these government degrees right in the end of the day like you know like these these degrees that are meant to sit like these managerial degrees which came out of like the the rockefellers and the carnegies right who needed people to run their machinery run their plants and run the logistics right like how do you get a petroleum engineer when petroleum's only been like used uh you know like industrially for you know i mean whatever you know like 10 15 years how do you do this well like you need to like stand here and actually have somebody like create an entire course so like they're going to fund schools how do you have workers who like literally all they know how to do is like you know train cows right and like fucking milk cows and grow vegetables you're going to put them on a plant turning a wrench they have no idea how to do any of these things they never they never even owned a car right they don't have any fucking machinery like the heaviest machine they have is a hoe right <laughs> like or a plow that they attach to their horse right these type of like 
So what you need to do is you need to set up an entire education system so that you can sit here and have workers, right? And then you need to be able to set up like governments that are able to run these education systems and run like infrastructure that's going to be able to build roads and, and I mean like maintain uh, fucking pipelines and water and electricity and all the things that happen from like 1860 to like fucking 1900, right? And so what ended up happening was is the government now needs managers to be able to manage all this infrastructure that was being built in a massive fucking scale, bridges and roads and all these type of things, right? Fast forward 30 years, you ended up with FDR, right? Or 20 years? 20 years, you ended up with FDR. FDR comes in, FDR stands here and, you know, I mean, brings in all the academics and basically takes the government and turns it into, you know, I mean, like what we know today. Wait a little man. Well, fucking Illuminati right <laughs> you know so this is where everything gets down to in the end of the day like this is this is where all this shit you know i mean kind of comes to fruition and so with understanding the reasons why things happened and then rockefeller i think he uh fucking died right at some point i forget when the hell it was right like the original john d rockefeller died i, I want to say in like 1910 whatever it was right and he left a massive uh, motherfucking um, charity, right? The Rockefeller Foundation. And uh, so did Carnegie, so did Morgan, so did Mellon, right? All these people, they sat here and left all these giant ass uh, charities that ended up becoming ran not by their family members, but by academics. And these academics, what do they do? They stand here and they fucking run them like academics will run things. You know, let's use them for social and communist causes basic right all the libraries that were built in america were built by fucking rockefeller and carnegie right and morgan right all the swimming pools same thing right all your school systems were all built by these fucking people right and why was that because they needed fucking workers simple you know i mean how do you expand my business without having a workforce this is where all this shit comes down to right and then the government took over from there you know, I mean, after they broke up fucking, you know, I mean, Standard Oil and, you know, like Morgan ended up fucking dying and, you know, uh, Carnegie sold off the fucking Morgan, right? And then you had Ford and then Chevy and then all these things, right? And then like the market kind of opened up and then you had a whole bunch of corporations until like the 19 fucking 30s and 40s, right? Or 40s and 50s. And then they turned in like they all started conglomerating into like, you know, smaller and smaller fucking or like into like you know single corporations right so less and less and went from you know mountain dew and pepsi and fucking dr pepper and all these things were their own things and then they started buying each other and turning into massive big fucking corporations you know gm you know always had a bunch of things under it but like then it ended up with a whole lot more just like chrysler chrysler started off as being chrysler then it bought dodge then it bought you know i mean fucking amc right it was jeep and then all these things right so, and now it's Stellantis, right, which is an even bigger corporation, which owns, you know, like Fiat and fucking Ferrari and all this stuff all over the place. So, all these things that ended up happening, right, over the course of the 20th and the early part, earlier parts of the 21st century, right, in the end of the day, led us to where we are now, right? And the governments are, they grew alongside of all the things that happened. And they literally had the same management class coming into them, being trained in the same places in the same shit as the people who are running the corporations. That's what Yarvin says. That's what everybody says. Because that's what the fuck happened. And you can be mad at Yarvin for standing here going like, man, listen, stop fucking squirming. Right? Stop sitting here like, yo, fucking trying to stop these people from doing what they're going to fucking do no matter what happens. You know, but like you want to sit here and act like, you know, this is some shit that you, you know, I mean, like you, you have to stop right now. We have to win. We have to fight back. What, what are you fighting? You don't even know what you're fighting. Like you're the right is a coalition of like evangelicals, libertarians, corporate people, like <laughs> racists, Nazis fascists you know like people who are dissatisfied with how things are happening anti-gay human beings grill americans right like just it, it's a fucking giant coalition of like people who don't give a fuck right and like 
For instance, you go to a right wing place and ask about unions. Right? I'll bet you there's a whole bunch of motherfucking union workers, right, who will fucking go like, yeah, pro union, hell yeah, man, right? And there's a whole bunch of motherfuckers who are like, fuck unions, they're terrible, right? We can't agree about motherfucking shit. This is why we can't, like, it's why you don't, it's why this doesn't make any sense to fucking stand here and squabble with the left. All you're doing is expending political energy uselessly, legit, fight on big motherfucking issues where we can hold ground. These are not places where we can hold ground. Like, legitimately. Corporations are standing here like, oh, fucking doing the LGBTQ shit, right? They're going to keep doing the LGBTQ shit. I promise you. Right? They're going to keep finding new ways to fucking do it. Because that's what they need to do. That's what they want to do. And you know what? This next generation is going to be a whole bunch of fucking trannies and motherfucking bisexual motherfuckers and whatever it is, right? They're all going to be all over the place. And you're going to lose any fucking way. Why? Because you don't have a fucking culture. It's that simple. Because you think you're white. Let's keep rocking, old man. Let's keep rocking. From the party line, which shows that they don't have power. So he's shielding corporations and yet complaining about their results, i.e. progressive culture, even though it's directly tied to the corporations. And then I guess the last thing we talked about was uh, that, that mold bug it's actually an, an agent provocateur seeking to incite violence, the young chimp, old chimp, Schrodinger's chimp, as Logos calls it, and his uh, changing definitions of formalism, which indicate that he's actually trying to create an uncertainty, which he says will lead to some sort of violence. That's sort of where we were at, uh, summarizing 2007. <laughs> okay, I remember that. I think I think the last bit might be a little too much there in terms of I mean, maybe he is really that clever and intelligent that he's setting up this really, uh, <laughs> like, this 20-year op where he's sowing uncertainty in order to cause violence. And, you know, in this exact way he tells us in the blog, I don't really buy that, but sowing uncertainty is something he does. I guess he does it on purpose. I mean, I don't see how he couldn't because a few months ago I was trying to do a, uh, a blog post uh, about, I think, neocameralism or something. And I was like, I just let me go refresh myself on the exact technical definition of neocameralism. And I found like neocameralism is, is this, neocameralism is formalism, neocameralism is that. There are like five different definitions for it. And I was like, well, what the hell, man? Like, I can't actually. He sort of makes his claims unaddressable because he can just change the definition of anything at will. Going back to the first thing you said, I think, yes, absolutely, he has seduced the right. This is a very typical sort of leftist thing where they tell you what they're going to do to you and then they do it or they like claim that the other party is doing it. So you see this a lot with the American government where they project all the bad things they're doing onto like someone like Vladimir Putin, for example, like they accuse Putin of all the same things that they're doing, um, you know, and, and Yarvin's following like a similar train where he's like, yes, we're going to seduce the left, but in reality, he's just seducing the right. And I think it's clear that they are seduced because when you, when you talk to people about Moldbug's ideas, it's pretty rare to actually see Moldbug's cases for things, like particularly the inaction presented in some sort of logical argumentative way. He's more or less just cited, like Moldbug said this, like Moldbug said that, you know, you don't want to quote unquote flex power, whatever that means, uh, because if you flex power, that like triggers the leftists and it agitates them and then makes them come after you even harder. And it's like, okay, well I can see how that's not entirely unreasonable, but you haven't actually like demonstrated anything. Like you can just assert that you shouldn't flex power because you're going to trigger leftists and then they're going to attack you. But like, how do we know that's always going to happen anytime you flex power, whatever that exact phrase even means. Uh, Andrew Tate is probably the best example of this. <laughs> like it's legit. What happened to Andrew Tate? Right? You know what I mean? What happened to Tucker? Right? Like, what, what happens to all these people who flex power? What happened to Elon Musk? What happened to Joe Rogan? All these individuals who flex power, you know what I mean, immediately get fucking attacked by the goddamn system. Right? In the end of the day. That's how it works. 
right? I mean, if you don't want to accept that, that's your business. You know, I mean, like, oh, it is what it is. Like, oh, this, but this is just reality. I don't, you know, what I mean, I don't know exactly how to like fix that inside of your brain. You know what I mean? Like, if you don't see that happening, you know, what I mean, oh, I'll give you another good one. Uh, Matt Taibbi, right? Matt Taibbi and Schellenberger, right? Matt Taibbi went on Capitol Hill here recently to go and, you know what I mean, address, like, the government standing here trying to, like, you know, uh, like, you know, screen post for, like, conservative or right-wing people on Twitter, whatever it is, right? And what ended up happening? The IRS and the FBI showed up at his fucking house and they're now investigating him. Trump stood here, you know what I mean, and, like, yo, you know, ended up becoming, you know what I mean, president, and what did they do? You know what I mean, like, they fucking sat here and smashed him, you know what I mean? Like, oh, they, they have, like, every case on the planet against them. This happens all the fucking time, you know what I mean? If you don't want to accept that, that's your business, you know what I mean? But it's just reality. So, there's all these sorts of ways where he sort of tricked people into just thinking that all these sort of, uh, neologisms that he's come up with are just sort of de facto true despite not really actually demonstrating them and that was one of the most interesting things about the whole series is you sort of demonstrate in your series that he never actually completes almost any of the arguments he makes like he says i'm going to show how xyz and then he just goes off in direction w and just doesn't actually prove any of x y or z and starts talking about unrelated things but then by the time you get to the end of the essay you you like feel like you have been convinced of x y and z because of the way he writes which is kind of like what seduction is uh it's not logical it's it's a feeling he puts you under um and okay you also said like two three and four i don't remember which things they were but i think those are the the big ones is the seduction is absolutely spot on and uncertainty is key to how he operates because he's you can't just claim to have, you can't claim to be like a formalist or a neo cameralist or a neo monarchist and not even have an actual definition for those things. I mean, any, any honest person I engage with, if they call. All right. So, okay. Um, let's, let, let's discuss this, right? When you say neo anything, right? We all hate it. Everybody hates, you know, neoliberals, you know, like neo-fascists, neo, you know, I mean, neo-cameralists, neo-reactionaries, right? All this shit, right? Neo-Nazis, right? And the reason why, like, we say neo is because that means new, right? And so, like, they're not a carbon copy of the old thing, right? Like, especially when you're creating something from scratch, right? Like, when you're, when you're standing here, like, coming up with a political ideology, like, you know, I can say, like, history, you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't repeat, but it rhymes, right it when it does rhyme the issue is is that it is a different fucking thing right so like you have to adjust for new shit right like the internet or like whatever the case is you can't use the exact same playbook you used to play like right you know i mean like this whole like neo-marxian ideology right when you have you know i mean like marxism like you can't use marxism in the same way that you know i mean like marxists use it in the 1800s like it, that doesn't work right <laughs> It has to be updated, right? You know, all these things like neo-reactionary. Like, you're, you're not a reactionary. You're just a new reactionary, right? You're not a camera list. You're a neo camera list, right? <clears throat> and so, therefore, like, you're like, yeah, I'm taking some of the things from this. I'm taking some of the things from some other stuff. I'm updating it. You know what I mean? Like, I'm fucking standing here and I'm going like, man, listen. Like, you know, I'm, I'm out on a limb here. I'm creating something new, whole cloth, right? And this is something that, you know, how do I put this? Okay, um, when you look at, all right, how do I, I feel like, <laughs> like, he wants to stand here and try to, like, do something new, but he doesn't want all the smoke that comes with it, right? He wants to make radical change, but nobody wants to smoke with making radical change. Nobody wants to sit here and go like, yeah, man, like, you know, I'm, I want to do all this, but I, you know, I mean, like, I don't want to have to worry about being attacked, right? Like, literally, like, his kids are affected by what he does. And this is something that, like, these ki these guys here, like, Praise of Folly, Logo, Charlemagne, like, they don't have children, right? So, when you're doing things, what you do affects not just you, but your children as well, 
right? Like, his kids were, like, kicked off of fucking, you know what I mean, sports teams and denied entries to schools and all this stuff because of who he is. Understand something. Like, yo, so when he says, like, I'm not calling for action, right? Why would he not call for action? Because, like, yo, the last person who called for action, you know what I mean, is now doing two years in prison or three years or five years, Right. Um, you know, I mean, the head of like a uh, fucking the pride boy or you're the proud boys. Right. You know, I mean, who went, you know, I mean, the January 6th shit. Right. Literally, anytime you call for action, the system's going to come at you. and You have no idea what they can do. Right. Because at any time, some female like look at Julian Assange, for instance, challenge power. Right. Guy stood here and called out these motherfucking powerful people and fucking, you know, sat here and, you know, I mean, like showed the shit that they did. Expose the secrets of like, you know, I mean the fucking deep state as it were What'd they do? Smashed him just straight obliterated him. You know fucking said he fucking raped some chick <laughs> you, know, like, you know, what I mean they fucking sat here and locked him in a prison or locked him inside of like a fucking whatchamacallit Grabbed them now. They're fucking bringing them back to America so they can torture him Edward Snowden's hiding in fucking Russia Chelsea Manning got tortured for years, right? All of this stuff, right, legitimately, right, are, are are things that they they can do to you, right, with no motherfucking real like actual evidence, and there's nothing you can do, right, because they'll stack lawyers after lawyers after lawyers. They don't care whether or not you actually did whatever it is that you fucking did. That doesn't matter to them. And this is the fucking problem that you're facing, right? And these are like this is. Like, literally, like, it's not just right or left or whatever it is. It's when you want to make change and you want to call for change, right? It affects not just you, everybody else around you, right? Everybody attached to you. Trump's fucking, like, um, secretary is facing 90 years in prison. Nine, a secretary. That's not Trump. Nobody even knew who this dude was. He just had a job. Following his boss's orders. Reality, dude. Like, this is just... What are you talking about, man? Listen, the fuck is... Yo, look, man. All right? I gotta, I gotta go take a shit. <laughs> Yo, I'm an hour and a half into this. Look, uh, praise of folly. Um, like, yo, uh, I'm on Discord. You know I mean? That's probably the only place you can fucking reach me or leave a comment. You know I mean? I'll, I'll see if I can update the Discord link. Uh, yeah, I'll update the Discord link in the uh, description. And I mean, because I'll be real. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it is what it is. You want to have a conversation. Charlemagne, Logos. You know what I mean? Um, Because, like, uh, um, I don't know. And I'm going to go do some fishing this morning. So I'm going to holler at y'all. You'll know the deal. Like, share, and subscribe. I'm about here. Peace.